Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our gathering here at Evangel Community Church. Uh, we're excited to be able to gather together uh, and worship God today. It looks like we're a little late first service this morning, and I'm guessing that's because of the, the competition that's happening this afternoon with the chili cook-off, so I'm excited about that. I actually get to be a judge, so you better look out. I, I came hungry this morning. So welcome to all of you guys that are tuning in with us online as well. We're excited to have you gather with us. And we're going to open this morning with a passage out of Psalm chapter 134. And that says, Praise the Lord, all you servants of the Lord, who minister by night in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and praise the Lord. May the Lord bless you from Zion, he who is the maker of heaven and earth. And that's what we're gathered here today for, is to join together as one body of believers in fellowship and worship our great and awesome God. So would you bow your heads with me as we pray this morning. Father God, we come before you, Lord, and we thank you for your goodness, we thank you for your blessings, and we thank you for your grace and your mercy that is new every morning. God, thank you for the opportunity to gather together in unity as a body of believers through our faith in your son, Jesus Christ. And God, I just pray that today as we gather that our hearts would be yours. God, maybe the things that, that we've got hidden in there are the things that we've been trying to keep from you, Lord. We ask that you would expose those things today that you would shine your light into the darkness of our hearts and that you would renew us, that you would help us repent and that you would draw us closer into relationship with you. God, we thank you that that's all possible through the great sacrifice of your son Jesus on the cross. God, be with us as we worship you this morning. It's in Jesus' awesome name we pray, amen. If you're able, would you please stand with us as we sing this morning? Sorrow in David, my sin. Lost without hope, with no place to begin. Your love made a way to let mercy come in. When death was arrested, in my life began. Ash was redeemed, only beauty remained. My open heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to death. When death was arrested in my life began. Oh, your grace so Over me, you have made. 
You may be seated. Amen to that. My name is Travis. I'm one of the pastors here, and I get the privilege of sharing some announcements with you all this morning. So if you're new, if this is your first time here with us, or maybe you've been here a few times, we'd love to connect with you and get to know you a little bit better. And the easiest way to do that is grab your phone, text NEW to the number 906-287-4300, and there will be some prompts there that we'll just be able to begin a conversation with you. Also, if you have any prayer requests or anything like that, uh, you can text PRAYER to that number. Those get compiled throughout the week, and each Monday evening, uh, we get an email sent out to our prayer squad. So there's an amazing team of folks here at Evangel that are praying over the church and all the things that are going on in the lives of our people here. Uh, one of the ways that we do worship our God is through our, our giving, our tithes and our offerings. And one of the cool things that we do here at Evangel, it's a new ministry that your gifts have been able to launch, is our Celebrate Recovery ministry. And we're going to talk a little bit about that in just a moment. But we've seen folks from all throughout the community come and be able to connect in that as they deal with hurts, habits, and hang-ups. And none of that stuff would be possible to help introduce them to Jesus and give them some faith in their road to recovery without our generation generosity from really the generosity that the Lord has given us. So you can text uh, ECH give just to the number 77977. That's the easiest way to do it. There are boxes in the back. You can send in a check in the mail if you'd like to do that that way. But that is one of the ways that uh, we worship our generous God. One cool thing that's happening here next week is our indoor playground season is upon us. And even though the weather looks super nice next week, we're going to open the doors for our elementary school kids uh, up through grade 5. And so this year, that season is running through April 28th. The cost is $50 per family. The opening dates of that are going to be Monday, Wednesday, Friday from 3.30 to 5.30. You can also register or find out more information online at evangelup.org slash playground. And if you have any questions, you can stop by the Welcome Center or you can talk to myself as well. Uh, this is super exciting. This is the Celebrate Recovery Party that is going to be happening here on Saturday, November 19th. And it's a holiday pie party. It's hard to believe that the holidays are coming up on us and they're going to be here pretty quick. I know I've already seen some kids that have started their Christmas lists and things like that. But this year we want to reach out to the community and Celebrate Recovery is helping do that through this holiday pie party. So uh, we want you to bring your family, invite your friends, your coworkers, and just celebrate our good God with us together. Saturday, November 15th, starting at 5, you can find out more information or you can help out with that if you sign up at the Welcome Center as well. And this is for my college students. We have Fuse this Thursday, uh, 7 p.m. here at the church. Bus pickups are going to be starting at 645 at Wads. We've got a great carpool culture, so you won't be stranded here all night long. Uh, but we're going to have a time of fellowship, just hanging out, hearing some of God's word, and praising together with our awesome worship team, and uh, having some food as well. Uh, we've got our chili cook-off today after second service, so if you're here and you want to come back for that, please do so. Uh, but we're going to be hanging out. There's going to be cornhole. We're doing a chili competition, so if you head back there to the Life of Living Center side, you'll see kind of the traveling trophy that's on the line for today. So we'd love to have you guys hang out with us. The playground's going to be open for your kids to run around, and it's going to be an awesome time together. And lastly, we have Operation Christmas Child that is taking place now. So you can help spread the gospel to kids that might not hear it. You can help spread some Christmas cheer that, to kids that otherwise might not get anything for Christmas. So there are boxes that are in the back by the Welcome Center as you came in in the lobby there. You can pick one up. We just ask that you fill it up. There's a list of things there that they're looking for. And just pray over that box. You don't know who it's going to go to or how it's going to reach those kids. And so we just ask that you would... Uh, Pay the $10 for shipping with that and then have them back here on the table by uh, the 6th of November, it looks like. So if that's something you're interested in, grab your boxes and make sure you get those back by Sunday the 6th. And now we're going to continue to worship together, so would you please stand with us if you're able.
passion in my heart, this stirring in my soul, to see the nations bow, for all the world to know. Search the world, but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough. Then you came along, you put me back together. Every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing 
better than you know there's nothing better than you know there's nothing nothing is better than you i'm not afraid show you my and flaws, Lord, you see them all, and you still call me friend. God of the mountain, is the God of the valley. There's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again. Better than you, Lord, there's nothing, nothing is better than you. You turn morning to dancing, you give beauty for ashes, you turn shame in Glory. You're the only one who can. You turn morning to dancing. You turn beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. You turn praise into God. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. You're the only one who can. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Better than you, Lord, there's nothing, nothing is better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you, oh, there's nothing better than you, Lord, there's nothing, nothing is better than you. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. Turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. You're the only one who can. You're the only one who can. Amen. You may be seated. You remember what we're talking about, 10 4. You got it. <laughs> a 
There is. There is. We're not going to play it, though, this morning. Uh, but we are in a series called This Means War, and we've really been just looking at uh, theological truths and taking the theological truths and, and saying this is reality. This is what God is trying to teach us. This is what God is trying to, to help us to understand about this world that he created and we are creations of. Before we get started today, let's just pray. Father, we come and we just ask that you would just... Join us here this morning and continue to work in our lives, continue to work in our hearts. Help us to see the reality of what you have for us, what you see, God, we want to see also. We want to be able to see where our hearts have shifted from you to other things. We want to see um, how you, to respond uh, to you and to others. And God, we just ask that we would love you a little bit more today and that we would love others a little bit more today as we open your word together. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. When I was in seminary, uh, we had a research project to see how people's, um, my research project was to, to see how people's personalities connect uh, to their view of Jesus. And so our, our project wasn't really that great in the sense of we didn't have a large enough pooling of people and those types of things. Um, but we would ask people a, some questions and, and we would ask um, them, you know, we would determine their, their personality type and then we would ask a, a question about Jesus. And we had a whole list of possibilities of how they viewed Jesus. And so um, if they, the criteria was that uh, they, they were kind of a person who was kind of a little bit quieter or meek, they would always choose that Jesus was quieter and meek. And it, it seemed like a good indication of, um, you know, their personality was a determiner of how they would describe Jesus. So if somebody was really sociable, they would describe Jesus as being gre gregarious, someone who was like kind of non-conforming, you know, they would talk about Jesus or they would choose that he was autonomous, he wasn't a rule follower. But my favorite one of all was we went to a kid rock concert, not to the concert, but into the line to interview some people about their personality types. And we'd go through a series of questions with them them, and then we would ask them a question about Jesus. And so there was a guy there, and he was he was describing, and he was kind of think of just really amped up to go to this Kid Rock concert. If you're not familiar with Kid Rock, um, it's okay. It, it's a, kind of a, a, a wild time party type of a, a band, it would be. And, and he describes, you know, himself as the same way, kind of like, you know, Jesus was awesome. He was incredible, you know, and he would talk about, he talked about Jesus in this way. And he said he was a revolutionary. He flipped tables. And so he knew some things about Jesus, and she said, G Jesus would be right next to me in this line, ready to rock and roll with Kid Rock. I'm not sure that's true, um, but it was a projection of his, his personality. Kevin DeYoung wrote an article, and uh, he, he said that this. He said that there was a, uh, if the question that Jesus asked, um, just hold up on that quote just for a second. Um, the question that Jesus asked uh, the, his disciples, he, he, the question of, um, let me get here, grab, what, what, what did Jesus ask? Jesus asked them, who do you say that I am? That question is relative for them, but it was also, it's also relative uh, for us. Who do we say that Jesus is? And, and he goes into this article and he, he begins to ask some questions because not every Jesus that we say, hey, this is Jesus is actually really Jesus. And he goes through a bunch of different ones. He says, there's the Republican Jesus who is against tax in increases and activists, judges, and for family values and owning firearms. There's the Democrat Jesus who is against Wall Street and Walmarts and for reducing our carbon footprint and spending other people's money. There's this therapist, Jesus, who helps us cope with life's problems, heals our past, tells us how valuable we are, and not to be so hard on ourselves. There's the Starbucks Jesus, who drinks fair trade coffee, loves spiritual conversa conversations, drives a hybrid, and goes to film festivals. There's the open-minded Jesus, who loves everyone all the time, no matter what, accepts for people who are not as open-minded as you. 
There's the touchdown Jesus who helps athletes run faster and jump higher than non-Christians and determines the outcomes of Super Bowls. There's the martyr Jesus, a good man who died a cruel death so we can feel sorry for him. There's the gentle Jesus who was meek and mild with high cheekbones, flowing hair, and walks around barefoot wearing a sash and looks like a German. Um, There's the hippie Jesus who teaches everyone to give peace a chance, imagine a world without religion, and helps us remember all you need to do is love. There's the yuppie Jesus who encourages us to reach for our full potential, reach for the stars, and buy a boat. And he goes on and on in this whole thing about these, these Jesuses. And at the end of the article, he says this. And we'll put it up on the screen for you. And then there's Jesus Christ, the son of the living God. Not just another prophet, not just another rabbi, not just another wonder worker. This Christ is not a reflection of the current mood or the projection of our own desires. He is our Lord and God. He is the Father's Son, Savior of the world, and substitute for our sins, more loving, more holy, and more wonderfully terrifying than we ever thought possible. What is he saying? All of this is... We can get the wrong Jesus. We can worship the wrong Jesus. And how we answer the question of who do you say I am is of great importance. But how do we answer that question? How do we get information about who Jesus is? Well, the way that we get information is that we trust what his word says about him. Not our feelings, not our, our, our political agenda. He is not, Jesus is not you incarnate. He's God incarnate. And so if you have your Bibles, turn to Colossians chapter 1. And uh, we're going to, to walk through this passage that is just, I think, just an amazing passage about describing who Jesus is. It, the Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Paul says Jesus is God. We've been talking about the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We put the Holy Spirit before we put the Son in, and so we're going back. And remember, we talked about the Trinity in the sense that they are, it's one times one times one, which equals one. And so Jesus is a part of that. The Son is a part of that. This this dance, this eternal dance that God has invited us into. And it says here that the Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all. Paul says Jesus is God. We am Uh, When we see an image, we think of copy or facsimile. But in Greek philosophy, it was much different than that. And a a copy or an image, it it had a share in the the reality that it reveals. And so it was said to be reality. An image was not considered something um, distinct from the object it represents. And so when Paul uses that phrase... He's thinking in that Greek philosophy. The first thing we, Paul says to us is that Jesus is God. Do you want to know what God looks like? You look at Jesus, right? Do you want to know how God responds to our mess? You look at Jesus. Do you want to know what God does with our sin? You look at Jesus. Do you want to know what God does in all areas of our life? You look at Jesus. He is the image of the invisible God. Now, all of you who have gone to Sunday school or have read the, the gospel, some of you are reality readers right now and you're in the book of Matthew. When we say look at Jesus, what do we automatically go to? We automatically go to the Gospels, right? Those, those years where Jesus is born, so you have the Christmas story, you have one little account where he's 12 years old, and then you go to those three years, right? The 30 to 33. And, and you go, man, this is Jesus. And, and it's, it's, it's necessary to do that. And we think maybe of, of some of his miracles, like feeding of the 5,000 or healing people with leprosy. Um, or one of my favorites, when he tells Lazarus, you know, rise from the grave. That's an awesome story. And that's what we think of. But yet in this passage, it's something different that Paul is inviting the church into. 
it, it's, it's outside of that limited view. He never addresses any of those things. He never addresses in that passage uh, what Jesus did in his ministry. And, and he invites us to step back in this moment and to look at the big picture. Um, those three years are super important and that they give us a lot of, of who God is. But when we step back, we see that Jesus is not limited to those 33 years. That's why he says he is the son. He is the image of the invisible God. And then he says this. He says, the firstborn over all creation. The firstborn over all creation. And when we think of firstborn, we think uh, chronology. We think, you know, like... Uh, we have twin boys. One is 30 seconds older than the other one. One is named Levi, one is named Everett. Um, Everett is the oldest, right? We think of it like in those terms. But that is not how he's using that term there. It, it, the term in the Old Testament is a term of rank or status or title. It, it, it's a position over all creation. Um, he's the firstborn over all creation. Psalms 89, 27 says, I will appoint him to be my firstborn, the most exalted of kings of the earth. Firstborn over all creation. Jesus outranks, and this is what it means, Jesus outranks all of creation. He is above all cre creation. And, and this doesn't mean that he was created. He is the creator. And so he, he explains this to us, why he's above all creation in the very next verse, he says, For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is the creator. He is the image of the reality of God. The last statement, did you, did you notice that there? It says... Um, all things have been created through him and for him. It's the answer to everything you need to know about yourself that I need to know about myself. It answers two of the most um, important questions or most popular existential questions in the world. Who am I? And what's my purpose? Both of these are answered right in that statement. All things have been created through him and for him. Why were you created? You were created for him. So you're created by him, for him, by him, for him. And, and this changes some things. Some of you are going, well, what's my purpose? And we all do this at some point. Like, like, what's my purpose in life? What, what am I supposed to do? Um, maybe you're retired and you're going, well, now what's my purpose, right? I, I, this was my purpose over here. And, and you're, you're waiting to get, maybe you're waiting to get done with school and, and to get a job. And then you'll, you're thinking, well, then I'll have purpose. Well, according to this passage, you have purpose now. You were created by him for him. And, and, and you are created by him for him. You were created with purpose what do you work for? You work for him. It, it's to parent for him. It's to go to work for him. It's to practice hospitality when we don't really want to practice hospitality. Why do we do that? For him. Why do we come to church? For him. Why do we go to school? For him. When we get caught up in thinking, and, and I think this is an important part of this passage, when we get caught up in thinking that things are for us, it gets a little dicey, right? When I'm in my marriage, more for me than for him, right? When I'm parenting for me or for them more than for him, like, you, you get this, right? Like, if I'm parenting for me, my kids better do what they're supposed to do because it makes me look good, Right? But if I'm parenting for him, what am I doing? I, I, I'm trying to instill who he is in their lives. I'm trying to, to, to walk with them in the reality of his world. It's for him that we do all of this. This is our reality. It's by Jesus, for Jesus. He made us. He is the image of Oh, what we are called to become. And his reality is the only reality that ought to form our understanding of ourselves. 
you're, if you are a son and daughter of the Most High, what, what the Holy Spirit, we talked about this last week, is moving you, transforming you to, is the image of the Son. You have purpose. And it's not dependent on you, right? It's not dependent on your financial stability, the, the perfect kids, the perfect marriage. You don't have to have all your ducks in a row to start living the purpose that you were created to live. He goes on, he says, he is, in verse 17, he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Um, he's eternal. Jesus existed forever. And I, I'll be honest, if you think about this forever thing, this eternity thing, it kind of creeps me out just a little bit because it's so big and my, my mind can't really wrap it, itself around the idea. But I also take some refuge in that. In that God is so massive and so big um, that it, it, it changes our perspective. It's not just these 33 years, but Jesus was there when the world came into existence. Jesus was there when everything before the world happened. And it leads us to this awe of who he is. And what it says here, and I love this, is in, in him all things hold together. He holds all things together. The reason you and I are here breathing is he's holding it all together. He's holding the stars in the sky. He's, he's holding it all together, the whole universe. Maybe when you were a kid, you sang this song, he's got the whole world in his hands. The whole wide world in his hands. He got the wind and the rain in his hands. You like that song, 10-4? No? Yeah, you, got, you like that one? All right. All right. Um, and, but that song is true, right? He's got this whole world in his hands. And, and because he holds everything together, here's the reality for you and I. You don't have to anymore. You don't have to hold it all together. Let me ask you a question. What are you holding in your hands really tight right now? Is it your relationships? Is it your future? Is it your kids? Is it your finances? Yes, he's entrusted these things to our care, but ultimately with this passage, he's teaching us that he's the one who holds it all together, not us. Christ is more than a force that preserves the, the orderly arrangements in the cosmos. Um, he, he's the operating system of all of this. The universe is not self-sufficient, nor as individuals who are created by him are we self-sufficient in this. Even people who don't acknowledge Christ's reign and who um, actively oppose him, he still has them in, their, in his hands. We cannot hold everything together. The truth of this world is um, we weren't meant to do that. That's his job, right? And, and have you ever had one of those days where it feels like the weight of the world is upon you? And it really isn't, and you know that, but um, it just is not working out how it's supposed to work out. I had one of those days this week where... Um, I, I was trying to listen to, I, I fixed my Alexa, and I was trying to listen to my Bible reading in the morning. Well, now the Alexa will play it, but it plays it silently. I don't know how it thinks I'm going to hear this. And, and so it just goes to the next chapter after about 10 minutes. Now on to Matthew chapter 10. And, but you, Matthew chapter 9 has not been read to you, right? And so I'm like so frustrated, can't figure this out because I am not a computer super freak guy. I'm like, I'm very mad at you, Alexa, right now, and she doesn't really care. And so that's the start of my morning is I'm, I'm, I'm frustrated with that. And, and I, there's things here at work I was coming into and I knew it. And it was just all of this stuff felt like it was, I, I was holding on to it and I had to solve it and I had to do it. And then I get in the van, our big blue van. And I back it out of the driveway, and I turn it around, and I go down the driveway. My wife is the last one to drive this thing, and I go to stop, and, and, and the brake goes right to the ground. And I thought, holy smokes, 
what did she do, right? That is not the response you walk back into the house with. That was very bad. But I felt like, like now i got to fix this. And what's going on? Like, the whole world just felt like it was so heavy. And, and my kids were doing something that was annoying me. And, it, and I was like, i got to root that out of them, right? Like, I, it was everything which just felt so heavy. And I was holding on so tight. And I came back. And I came back to the office. And, and, and I was sitting there. And I had stopped the day before writing the sermon. And I stopped at this verse. He is before all things. Go back to that. It's verse 17. He, he's before all things, and in him all things hold together. And I went, oh, my. I'm trying to take the role of God in my life. And it was just, just this moment, me and God sitting there, and me going, I give them back to you. They're not mine. Anybody else in that place right now? Just where you're just holding on to things and you think you have to hold it all together. You're the one who has to make all. Yes, you're entrusted with things. But are you just holding on really too tight to things? Are you holding on to your finances so tightly and you're going, God, I, or not even God, you're not even asking God. You're just like, I got to make this work. I got to do this over here. I got to do this over here. Because what happens when we do that is it produces anxiety in us. When we think that our marriage, when we're not living in our marriage for him, and it's about the other person, and they're not fulfilling me, they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing, and I know it, and God, I'm going to pray for them to do what they're supposed to be so I feel good, and we're not living in this, this whole thing for him. I think we get some problems in our lives. We have anxiety, we have pain, we have frustration. And, and what Jesus invites us to do, because he holds all things together, what does he invite us to do? He invites us to open our hands and give it back to him. All of you who are weary and heavy laden, come to me and I will give you rest. I'll give you rest. He invites us to do that. I'm, I'm just wondering, is there anybody in here, and you don't have to raise your hand, is there anybody in here who's just like, man, I've been holding on to this too tight. Maybe it's your future. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's your finances. Maybe it's your kids. You've been just holding so tightly onto these things and not handing them back to the one who is good all the time. Who's, who, who is, he has entrusted these things to you, um, but he's holding it all together for you. Is anybody in that place? I just want to take a moment. It was really powerful me for me to go you know what, I don't have to hold all, it might not go perfe perfectly in all of this stuff. You've entrusted this stuff to me, but I hand it, my hands are wide open. What do you want me to do, God? How do you want me to do this? And let's just bow our heads just for a moment. I know this, this isn't the end of the sermon, so don't get excited. Um, but just, just, just release it. Just give it back to him. Whatever that may be. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's your schooling. Maybe you're not just doing so well in it. I'm not saying don't try. I'm, what I'm saying is, God, I, I can't hold on to this so tightly that I have to produce. I have to produce. I'm the one who has to fix all these things. You can't fix your spouse. And if you try to do it, it's going gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna to cause more issues. You have to release them back or her back. Maybe it's your kids. And you want so desperately for them to, to, to follow after Jesus, but they're not there. They're following the world right now. Lease them back. Give them back. He's the one who holds all this together. Just take a moment. God, we trust you, and we just thank you for this moments that we can hand things back to you, because you have all things in your hands. He goes on in this verse, in verse 18, and he says, um, he is the head of the body, the church. Man, I love that passage of scripture right there. And, and he is the head of the body, He's talking about Jesus, the church. I love this, this phrase um, because what it does is it takes pressure off of me, 
and it takes pressure off of our leadership team. You may go, man, that was a horrible sermon um, today. You may walk out of here and go, that was terrible. That's what the God gave me. You talk to him about that. <laughs> He's the head of this thing. He's the one who's going to transform your heart. I don't have to transform your hearts. Faithfully present the word of God to you, but I don't have to transform your heart. The leadership team doesn't have to transform your heart. And, and he is the head of the body, the church. What's interesting, I think, in this, in this passage is it takes pressure off. Um, but a body without a head is dead, right? And you forget about Jesus, uh, the church will die or your church will die because he's the head. And so we always here at Evangel want to lift Jesus' name up. He's the head. It's not us. It's not, it's not the pastors. It's not the leadership team. Uh, we, we're just here to help to lift his name up. He's the head of this. And I love this passage because it takes pressure off again. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead. Um, this, this idea of that he is the head of the, the church, I think if the leadership or if I think we are the head of this and it's not Jesus, what happens if a, a, a creation has like four heads? What do we call that? Halloween's coming, I'll give you a hint. It's a monster, right? It's, it's always Jesus, right? It's always the, he's always the head of the church. This is his institution. This is his baby. He's the one who transforms hearts. He's the one who moves. It's not some, some fancy words from a pulpit. It, it's not like the right programming. It's Jesus who does this. He is the head of the body. And that is an amazing passage, an amazing little chunk of that passage. Um. And we always want to point and look toward him. He is the beginning and the, and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. He, he's the head. He's the firstborn. This is a rank. When you read, um, when you read so in the Bible, it, it's going to give you something really a big reason usually, so that he might have supremacy in your life. Jesus is the head, the firstborn overall, so that he might be supreme in your life and in my life. Here's the question. And I wrestled with this in my own office. Is he? Is he does he have supremacy in your life? Is he first? Or maybe he's second in some areas. Maybe he's third in some areas. Is Jesus really, uh, does he really have supremacy in everything in your life? Open hands to him, but also he's first. He's the one that, that is holding this all together, but I'm giving it to him, and, and I want him to have all the glory in this. It, it's, I was created by him and, and, and for him, and so I'm doing this. And, and this isn't a shame thing, what I'm asking right now. It's not a shame thing. It's just a question, and it's okay if the answer is no. But it's something we have to ask ourselves. It, does he have supremacy in our lives? Does he have supremacy in our relationship, in our finances, in, 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 in the rearing of our children, or whatever it is? Does he have that? And, and this is not, again, this isn't a shame thing. But if God makes you aware of something, if he makes you aware that, hey, he's, he's number three on the list or number four on the list of something in your life, you know what he's doing? He's like, hey, I want to be, I want to I wanna heal that area of your life because you're not seeing it in reality. He, he wants the best for us. Jesus is holding all things together. And even when he is not in the middle of maybe our relationships or our parenting or our financing, uh, finances, there is this grace and there's always this invitation to bring him into that place. He's the good shepherd, always ready to speak into you, always ready to speak into your situation, to try to take the burden of trying to hold it all together from you. It's a beautiful passage. Firstborn, firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have supremacy. For God was pleased to have 
all his fullness, dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. The Old Testament, when God uh, chose a place, he, he would choose a place to, to dwell and to, to express his divine care. And, and he chose like places like Zion. God, God was there. And in, in another passage of scripture, it says he fills the heaven and earth. But in this passage, it says, for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. All of his fullness, fully and permanently, God was pleased. The Trinity was pleased that it would be held in Christ. This is better than a temple. This is better than any, any houses made with our hands. And it represents God to us. Jesus represents the invisible God to us all of his attributes, all of his activities, his spirit, word, his wisdom, his glory are all disclosed in the person of Jesus. The Trinity is all disclosed in, in, in the person of Jesus Christ. You want to know what God is like? You look at Jesus. All the attributes, all the activity, all the wisdom, all the glory dwell in Jesus. Why did, did God come to earth? Paul tells us, for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your own minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. Jesus was fully God and he was fully human. We, we see God's redemptive power in, in Jesus Christ. He's the first born, born among the dead. Death was our enemy that, that God had to defeat for us. Death comes, why? The wages of sin are death. That's what produced it, right? Death comes out of this. And God has to to come, to reconcile, to change us, to buy our pardon. And so it, it's, this is the crazy thing about Christianity. It's different than every other religion out there. Where God is, we're working our way to God. We're going up the ladder toward God. And the better you become, the more, the more spiritual you become, or the more spiritual you look, the closer you get to God. That's not Christianity. Christianity is God goes, yeah, nope, they can't make it. And he comes. God in the bod, his name is Jesus, comes down, fully human, fully divine, and he dies on the cross for us. Three days later, he rises again. He says we were enemies of God. And we're no longer enemies because what God did for us, he came down, he changed everything in that. The invisible God became very visible to us. This is Christmas, right? We're about to, in just a few weeks, we're going to celebrate Christmas together, which is crazy that it's this close. But it's this incredible story um, that is absolutely true that God came down. And took on flesh for you and I. The invisible God became very, very visible to us. This is who Jesus is. This is why he came. And he bought our pardon on the cross. His blood shed for you and I for the remission of sins. There was no other way to get us to that place. Let's go back to our top question. Who do you say that Jesus is? 
What image of Jesus do you have? Is it really the in, image of the invisible God, or is it more of an image uh, of your wants and desires, a personification of your personality, a desire for God to be a, your personal a genie in the bottle? Here's the deal. He's not that. And he won't bend to our incorrect views of who we think he is or who we want him to be. However, he, he has set eternity on your heart and on my heart. And, and we are living in, in, um, living in it. We're living in eternity. And we've talked about this, John 17, uh, 3. We're living in eternity when we know God. The way that we know God is through the person of Jesus Christ. He is the, the visible image of the invisible God. He, this is how he plays his role in the Trinity and we're held together by him and for him, which is an incredible thing for us to, to weigh in. Any other image of Jesus that we have, that he is not creator God, that he is not the one who is the, the, uh, the visible uh, God of the, the image of the, the invisible God is simply a false God. What he says about himself through this special revelation known as the Bible is who he is. There is no other Jesus. There isn't a, the Republican Jesus, the Democratic Jesus, the martyr Jesus. There's only one Jesus, and it's found right here in the text. And, and we can't define him another another way, but here's the beauty of this. You can know him. You can know him. One of the ways that we know him is through his word. Some of you are reading um, the Gospel of Matthew right now. What an incredible story. Uh, you should be about 14 chapters in, um, in, in your reality reading. I just encourage you to continue to read through that. Because this is a picture of who God is. This is a picture of who, who Jesus is. This is a picture of, of this invisible God that we worship and that we call out to. And that we're trained to cry out, Abba, Father. And so today, as we close, just a couple of questions. What's the Jesus that you have in your mind? You can close your eyes, and I'm going to pray in just a moment. What's the Jesus that you have in your eyes? Is it the Jesus of prosperity? Oh, he's going to make things good. Is it the, the Jesus of health? It's not wrong to pray for health. But is it this who he is to you? Or is he the son of the living God? Is he, is he truly the Christ, as Peter spoke into is he in charge of every area of your life if he's not again I just invite you to open your hands and give whatever that is whatever the spirit has laid upon your heart uh, to back to him because he has all things he holds all things together and that includes you and me it includes our situations it includes everything that we have he holds it all together father we come before you and we just ask that we would see the real jesus that we would not just think of him as uh, just this gateway to get to heaven, but we would know him and walk with him. He would be the one that we would, we would follow deeply, God, because uh, Jesus is God. That we would hold to that, that we would know that, that we would walk out of here even today um, knowing that you hold all things together. There is nothing that is outside of your grasp or your grip and, and that we could walk in the truth and the peace that you care and you love and you want to heal things that are broken in us that we've held too tight or or have tried to fix on our own you want to heal those things in us you want to change things in our heart through the work of your spirit and and we have this incredible ability because of what jesus did for us to cry out, Abba, Father, and know that you hear our, our, our prayers. God, we just ask today that Colossians um, 1 would be seared into our hearts, that we'd see this big picture of who you are through the work of Jesus and what he's done for us, and that we would know you and, and our purpose uh, that we are created by him and for him, that we would, we would take that into every area of our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Please stand and sing with us.
assurance that Jesus is mine. And oh, what a foretaste of glory divine, heir of salvation, purchase of Spirit washed in his blood. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long.
May the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times in every way. May the Lord be with you all.